spires of their temples. What commanders tell the soldiers in their service? The Indomitus Crusade meets with triumph after triumph. Day by day we tear Imperium Nihilus from the Despoiler's grip. And though we are beset on all sides, with each battle we drive back the mutant, the heretic, the alien. <laughs> As I speak these words, our forces engage the remnants of Leviathan. Reclaiming lost worlds, atoning for old shames, a crusade to cleanse the stars. the fight to the enemy. We routed the Tyranids at Baal. We broke their high fleet. Soon, their foulness will be but a memory. That is what the preachers say. Right, hello. Welcome to my slightly informal, slightly scripted 10th edition video. First things first, Terminators. I like how they just uh, didn't even bother to be like, oh yeah, they're kind of primaries. They're just literally like, Terminators are bigger now. Awesome, fine. Frustrating for me because I have a lot of metal old Terminators, but I'm still going to use them just smaller on the right basis. Anyway, 10th edition, they finally went and did it. This year, presumably not far down the line, we're going to have access to the 10th edition of Warhammer 40,000. I uh, decided I would break down the key points in chapters in this video that you can check in the timestamps below or the chapters thing. Short intro overview first. 10th edition alone seems a huge concept to me. 
which might sound a little bit over the top, but it's just that, in honesty, I never anticipated when I was 10 years old opening my second edition box set in all that nostalgic glory that I would be sitting here decades later at 5am, which is when I started writing about this, the release of the 10th edition. Also, it's the 10th edition, which for some reason always seems a bigger deal for people because we enjoy our numeric milestones for no reason that I've ever been able to fully grasp. Anyway, the law that has been announced is obviously huge. In fact, not just huge, it's, it's large. And the changes to the game sound pretty interesting and impressive. It sounds in fact quite dramatic, but we'll get to that later. The short version is that in the dying light of 9th edition 40k, the Lion has returned. Lionel Johnson, Primarch of the Dark Angels. He's returned to the fray at a critical time. Let's be thankful it just wasn't Dawn. Although for those like Inquisitor Sabathiel, there are many in the Imperium who are undoubtedly still likely less happy about his return. But I'll go over and we'll talk about that as well in the first chapter here. But I should also speak about the game itself because the changes there are pretty significant. And whenever I talk about the next edition, I do try to speak about the other elements of 40k as well. One interesting lore detail that I'm sure some of you were not aware of, the lion was not one of the Primarchs who was confirmed dead or just missing after the heresy. In the broader sense, yes, of course, but in terms of the lore, he was the only other Primarch that we knew definitely to be still alive, other than Gilliman. He was merely in a state, though, of waiting to return, stasis again, so the news of him reappearing at the critical time of crisis the Imperium is facing is both fitting and doesn't upend things or bring the R word into contention or anything like that. This is something that's been established really since the second edition of 40k, 30 years ago, nearly, and it continues to be one of the things I love about 40k. The continuity is just immense. Small fragments of information from decades ago, same with the Inari, comes out of nowhere, still retain relevance in the evolving lore. Now the game, I think it's safe to say that GW did see and hear what was being said about the game. Too complicated. Too big of a learning curve. Too many books and stratagems and the staggered codex releases it was getting to be a bit of an embarrassing mess. In terms of the game, this was a very needed overhaul, but it's pretty dramatic. The big news seems to be that they're going to make the rules, the points, the unit data available to download for all factions for free from day one which is a huge deal. This does though of course mean that all your current codexes are just shelved at the release of 10th, so bad times anybody who just picked up the latest ones. I wouldn't really worry about that too much though, they're still very nice books, I like having them on my shelves always. Plus, they were pretty keen to emphasise that again, yes, whilst your codex won't be relevant, remember you'll be able to download the rules and everything you need to play the game for free, so it's not like you then have to go out and buy new books. Also, I don't think that will be the end of Codex books either, but maybe they'll be reimagined into lore, perhaps specific gameplay details, maybe uh, specific campaign books, maybe similar to the things you see for Titanicus and Necromunda, heavier on lore, specific additional unit information, campaign missions, this kind of thing. I think that would be a huge positive step to retain that there. I love the campaign missions for Titanicus, as you well know, but of course we haven't tackled much discussing Necromunda. Hint. Now the game of 40k overhaul, like I said, is a big deal, and I would say this is probably the year to get your friends into 40k who have been on the fence about it, because you can play from day one. If you've got two armies and a friend who doesn't play, you can download all the rules and play. And if you've been one of those people like me who hasn't played for a few years because of COVID and the ninth looking like a massive headache that you didn't have time for, 10th looks very appetizing. I fully plan to give it a fair crack, which is really exciting for me. So let's have a look at all this in a little bit more detail. So what are the big lore hits that have been announced for 10th so far? Well, one of them is not even for 10th. It's Lionel Johnson returning as part of the Arcs of Omen series, which still falls under the 9th edition. So he's back very soon. Make no mistake, though, the return of the Dark Angels Primarch is a huge deal for the frontier of 40k lore. It's, it's really massive, because until now, Gilliman had been the only game in town. He returned to a fracturing, decaying Imperium in the dark days of M41. The Imperium he discovered was unrecognisable to anything he knew of humanity in the Imperium. Worse, it appeared to have fully embraced religion, 
so what in his time had been a small, irritating cult was now the state religion of the Imperium, something that continually grates against Gilliman. Then also, the Imperium had seemingly stagnated to a point that it was barely able to deal with the threats it's facing, on top of that often destroying itself from the inside with ridiculous petty rivalries, inefficient administrative practices and on and on. Unfortunately for Gilliman, things were not going to improve anytime soon as the fall of Cadia heralded the emergence of the destructive rift that tore the galaxy apart and left one side within the light of the Astronomicon, the other cast into darkness without the light of the Emperor, hence the law titles of Dark Imperium. So, the long story short is, Gilliman has been doing his best to keep it all together, paying lip service to the religious fanatics that irritate him to no end, but that he knows he has to keep on side so that they don't start some ridiculous war and destroy everything. Dealing with a suspicious Belisarius core, attempting to stop humanity sliding into darkness, then there's the unforeseen consequences of the rift, and that it appears to be empowering more human psychers than ever before. In turn, the Emperor also now appears to be stirring, in what sense, still unknown. But things are happening is perhaps the best vague summary. Then of course we have had the Primaris, a secret project between Call and Gilliman that has in effect given one small wedge of stability in an unstable time. Gilliman largely seemed to have the measure of things, he's the Lord Commander of the Imperium, and as he returned none could challenge him, he ruled over the galaxy of humanity as no one else were fit or empowered to do so, until now the Lion returns. Now, Lionel Johnson, Primarch of the Dark Angels. Can I fully summarise his entire life in this video? No. Can I give a small crack at it? Okay. I will say though, I need to obviously make some chapter or legion specific videos. I know, I know, blah, blah, blah. So I'm not going to do the whole complex duality of the Dark Angels thing today, really, in detail. But like all the Primarchs, the Lion was scattered to the galaxy, arriving upon the world of Caliban. It was a death world, contained extremely hazardous creatures inhabiting dense forest conditions. It was a feudal world in terms of its structure, but seemingly retained a lot of STC technology. They were even able to produce some rudimentary power armour, bolters, energy weapons and the like. A man, Luther, would find the lion, bring him to his knightly order. Lionel Johnson would eventually of course rise to become the Grand Master of their order. Because of its proximity to the warp, and for other reasons, Caliban was a troubled world. Luther would keep concealed some dark tomes. Although Johnson ordered them destroyed, Luther did not, instead beginning to read them. And this was the initial divergence, really, in the Dark Angels and their complex story, which persists all the way to M41. Eventually, the Emperor and the Great Crusade arrived on Caliban, the line, of course, being given command over the First Legion, Luther then, of course, made the second in command of the Dark Angels. But in a story repeated throughout those times, deep down, Luther began to resent the Lion, which, of course, was never something that was going to end constructively. When Johnson returned to Caliban, stricken with grief from the Emperor being placed and interred upon the Golden Throne, in a state of living death in the aftermath of the Horus Heresy, a salvo of fire knocked their ships out of orbit. Over the many decades, it was apparent that Luther had corrupted the remaining legion on Caliban. Johnson was understandably incensed by this and proceeded to bombard the planet, after which he and loyalist Dark Angels deployed across the world. The corrupt Dark Angels took hold in the Order's monastery and Luther and Johnson faced off. Ultimately, the planet would be destroyed due to the continual bombardment, the planet's crust would begin to shift, crack, and worse, as the Dark Powers realised they had failed yet again, a warp storm emerged to break the planet apart like an apple before being finally pulled into the warp. The immense force field surrounding the Order's monastery, though its fortress monastery, meant that they had protected it from being dragged into the warp, and so now bizarrely a single asteroid with the ruins of the fortress monastery were all that remained of Caliban, and this would become the appropriately titled Rock of the Dark Angels. When the Dark Angels investigated, the traitors had been dragged into the warp with the rest of the planet, but Johnson was nowhere to be seen. Enter the Watchers in the Dark. These are the figures which seemingly now took the comatose body of the Dark Angel Primarch to a secret chamber deep within the core of the rock. These figures are usually robed, they're very small in stature, they also appear able to resist the warp similarly to pariahs, and despite their curious appearance and nature, they do seem intelligent creatures who psychically communicate with one another. They've been seeking to guide the Dark Angels against Chaos since before the Horus Heresy, and they're acquainted with Xenos, such as Eldrad Ulthran. They were basically inhabitants of Caliban again originally. 
The Watchers seemed to welcome the coming destruction of Caliban, though, even though it was their world, seeing it as their last hope in their ambitions against Chaos, which they had been fighting for some untold length of time. And following the destruction of Caliban, the Dark Angels made this rock their new home, drilling out a huge network of rooms and halls in the bedrock under their ruined fortress monastery. Over time, engines were added then allowing the rock to travel across the galaxy. But the asteroid's so large, it hides many dark secrets. Of course, the biggest being that the lion himself remained deep within the rock, guarded over by the Watchers waiting for the time to return to the Imperium when it would need him the most. And that time, seemingly, is now. As for Luther, for the longest time he was believed to have remained within the rock also, but none could ever seemingly reach him. Shortly after the formation of the Great Rift, a demon prince, Marbas, launched an invasion of the rock that succeeded in freeing Luther. It is currently suspected that now Luther is assembling those of the Fallen into a new Dark Legion that could bring the galaxy to heal, which makes for an interesting prospect coming into the 10th edition of 40k. But of course the big question will be how will his return complicate matters for the Imperium in M41? Gilliman has now had essentially free reign to dictate the direction of the Imperium, its forces and its structure. However, with the return of the Lion, this changes the power balance of things significantly. It could, for example, not be very easy for the two Primarchs to immediately unite and speak to one another, although I look forward to the grandeur of when that occurs. Given the chaotic and disrupted state of the galaxy in the current time, who knows how long before Gilliman would even hear about his brother's return, and vice versa, although one would imagine with something so critical it would happen as a priority. Then of course there's the matter of the fact that Johnson will be entirely unaware of some pretty major changes in the order of things. He knows the status of the Emperor, of course, but he will not be aware of how the legions were broken into chapters, nor will he be able to appreciate the broader picture for humanity in M41, the fact that there is this now state religion, that Primaris are a thing. And while Gilliman has, for example, tolerated many of the changes in the Imperium, appreciating that to upend the order of things could trigger another galactic civil war for humanity, be more destructive than constructive, and that overall it's just nothing that the Imperium can afford at all, who knows if Johnson would agree with that premise? Will he still be in a grief-stricken state of mind in the aftermath of the heresy and essentially the collapse of his legion? and the betrayal of Luther, the return of another Primarch also calls into question the power balance of the Imperium. Technically, with both of the Primarchs sitting only one rung below the Emperor in the order of things, the Lion could claim power as much as Gilliman. Although, given Johnson is a loyalist, you would imagine he would not be so foolish as to just charge like a bull into the status quo and demolish the sliver of stability that Gilliman has been able to create since his return. You would imagine he would have slightly more decorum. Much like in the aftermath of the heresy though, it was seen and understood by the Primarchs that remained that one of them needed to oversee things, and that person at the time was Gilliman. Even if all did not fully agree, we know who, and give their full-throated approval of the fact. So the future for the Imperium is really as uncertain as it ever was. We will glean our first knowledge proper about Johnson's return in the Arcs of Omen series, and that's going to be coming pretty soon. And whilst I rarely jump ahead of a series like this, I think in this instance, when it comes out, it will require immediate discussion, because this is just something that is very rare in the extreme. It's a game changer for the Imperium and the state of play in the galaxy. It could mean the difference between the survival and collapse of humanity, and nothing less than that. Now, we're still not done on the lore side of things, because on top of the lion, there are obviously the other lore elements afoot in the announcement of 10th edition. So the lion appears to be this final element of the Arcs of Omen series, that is, Abaddon, Abaddon's crusading conflict, which has, with the emergence of Vashtor, brought up the prospect of the Dark Mechanicum, potentially becoming a new faction for 10th. And I should underscore, that is my pure speculation. But it seems feasible we could see such a thing during 10th edition. In terms of what's on the table right now though, it appears that the devastation of Baal was not quite devastating enough. For the launch of 10th, it seems that the Tyranids of High Fleet Leviathan are still chomping their way through the galaxy, and despite several apocalyptic conflicts, have not yet been eradicated, if they ever can be. So for my own law sanity, I need to state, Leviathan 
is the only Hive fleet not approaching from the east. The Hive fleet who assaulted the Ultramarines homeworld of Macrag was Behemoth during the First Tyrannic War. The 13th would again encounter the Tyranids during the Second Tyrannic War, as they again invaded Imperial space near to Macrag, but this was Hive fleet Kraken. There's a simple reason as to why Leviathan has not come from the galactic east as most other Tyranid fleets have, and that reason is that Leviathan is travelling up through the galactic plane. This means that unlike the other Hive fleets which follow across the galactic plane between systems, Leviathan are invading up through the galaxy. This makes it able to attack simultaneously across vast distances and from seemingly any number of different locations all at once. Not to mention that High Fleet Leviathan is one of the largest Tyranid fleets. It was Leviathan that caused Inquisitor Crippman to engage in his reckless purging of Exterminatus that saw the destruction of many hundreds of billions of human lives. 10th edition seems to be leaning in on this next phase of the Leviathan Tyrannic War for its launch, which designates it now as the 4th Tyrannic War. This time though, a segmentum so far relatively untouched, Pacificus, Galactic West of Terror. But when talking about Leviathan, we have to, of course, briefly mention, once again, Cryptman. Inquisitor Cryptman had always been on the more extreme edge of the Inquisition, but when he encountered Leviathan, he simply began exterminating worlds in Leviathan's path, creating a galactic cordon. Any world within this cordon would undergo exterminatus as soon as the Tyranids invaded, using virus bombs to purge all life on a condemned world. The theory being that it would cause the High Fleet to expend large amounts of resources to invade a world, resources that would then be lost with the planet's destruction. Billions died, and this has been infamously one of the largest acts of self-inflicted genocide by the Imperium since the Horus Heresy. Unsurprisingly, as a result, and despite his somewhat good intentions, Crippman was declared a traitor, fool, radical, stripped of his authority. Although this is usually more symbolic than literal when it comes to the Inquisition, and while Crippman now walks with a death sentence hanging over him, he's still an Inquisitor, so the chances of him ever being apprehended are pretty unlikely. Still, despite the insanity, there was some method to the madness, and he had managed to slow the advance of Leviathan. Crippman had also learned that when fighting the other Xenos of the Orcs, Tyranids tended to get embedded, bogged down for a significant amount of time, because both those species are used to fighting battles of pure attrition. So he believed this would be a solution to the problem of Leviathan, entangle the two Xenos in a battle zone that they could never win or escape from. Which brings us to, of course, Octarius. Now I've covered Octarius on the channel, so please see those videos for more detail, but essentially Crippman trapped the Orcs and the Tyranids in the war zone of Octarius, but there was, however, one small problem. For reasons that elude lore sense, Crippman had seemingly overlooked the fact that one of these two could at some point emerge victorious from the Octarius War. Although I don't really feel that overlooked is fair, it's not really the best word to use here to be honest, because it seems improbable that any Inquisitor could fail to see this as a possible outcome. I think more likely Crippman merely chose the best path for the short term given his resources. Unfortunately, the Tyranids appear to be getting stronger there, and so there exists this possibility that Leviathan will in fact emerge from Octarius more powerful than ever before. Not really something the Ordo Xenos is going to be very happy about, nor the rest of the Imperium for that matter. This though is just one small part of the overall picture when it comes to Leviathan, and a smaller piece of an even larger picture when we consider the Tyranids as a whole. Imperial worlds fall, Ultima fleet ships are destroyed, Forge worlds scoured. And one cannot speak about Leviathan and the Tyrannic Wars without mentioning Baal. Leviathan assaulted the Blood Angels' homeworld, triggering a battle that would last many years. Knowing what awaits them, Master Dante summons all successors of the Blood Angels to defend their shared heritage world of Baal. They dig in, resist against wave after brutal wave of the absolute worst the alien horrors can throw at them. Some 19 Tyranid assault waves later, the Astartes upon Baal are hanging by a thread. Five chapter masters lie dead, things look pretty hopeless. And this is when the Great Rift tears through the galaxy, and in so doing swallows the hive ships of Leviathan in the Baal system. 
In a broader picture, the Tyranids of Leviathan actually surge with the opening of the rift, exploiting the confusion and weakened Imperial worlds. Yet simultaneously, some of their own fleet are consumed within the void, and worse, the Tyranids find themselves fighting significant numbers of demonic horrors and other things from the void. Beings which offer them no biomass, no sustenance, but force them to expend it in vast quantities. Where previously the Tyranids would avoid unnecessary expenditure of biomass in fighting these void ghosts, now they're forced to engage with Chaos, unwittingly aiding the Imperium in their fight against both Chaos and also against the Tyranids themselves. For the surviving defenders of Baal and Baal Prime, they live to face a new horror as demonic entities descend on the world. Dante kills the alien's cohesive Swarm Lord, but takes critical damage himself. As a new fleet arrives in orbit, the ships of the Indomitus Crusade and Gilliman purge the last of the Tyranids, and they see off the warp horrors. There are of course many Tyranid fleets across the galaxy, Gorgon, Hydra, Tiamat, but Leviathan has led some of the largest and most devastating assaults, all of which have usually been within the Segmentum Tempestus, the galactic south, or the southwestern edge of the Ultima Segmentum in the galactic east. Now though, Leviathan appears to have engaged itself to the galactic west of Terra, the Pacificus Segmentum. And this is currently where we are, in terms of law announcement anyway. Oh, but there is one other small thing. Beastmen return. Perhaps controversially? Because do people ever really like Beastmen that much? Also, what are Beastmen and why are they returning? Well, the Beastmen are part of another boarding kill action team thing, yes. It's a supplementary box set. But it is unusual to see, I guess not a faction, but a sub-faction, perhaps released within a set such as this. It's got Votan in it, some cool scenery bits and pieces, but the largest thing to note is of course the Beastmen. Now Beastmen are one of those things that have gone for a long time, scoured from memory, but they've been scattered through the background material since the first edition. They appeared in the second edition Codex Imperialis, the Siege of Rax books, Codex Eye of Terror third edition, more recently, Xenologists, and even the 8th edition rulebook. So barely mentioned, yes, old law that has been purged, no. Beastmen are classified by the Imperium as abhumans. This means that like ratlings or squats and ogrin, they evolved at one time from humans as the Imperium deems it, but they changed due to environmental or other genetic pressures. And the Imperium qualifies them as abhuman rather than a true mutant, because mutants have to be purged and exterminated by the Imperium and their specific classifications demonstrate a consistent, identifiable physical standard, so not a mutant. There are billions of abhumans living within the Imperium, and they're generally tolerated and exploited by the authorities very much as is anyone within the rest of the population. With the exception that it is rare for them to reach positions of authority or power within the Imperial hierarchy, and many are subjected to just derision, fear, prejudice. Many abhumans are recruited into the service of the Administratum and its subdivisions, including the Imperial Guard, the Imperial Fleet, and in the Imperial Guard they're organised and fight in dedicated squads or companies, segregated very often from human comrades. The Adeptus Terror officially recognises 73 stable abhuman strains within the Imperium. Of these, 46 types are now listed extinct and no records received of a further 12 strains for over a generation suggesting that they too have died out or been assimilated back into the general population. The status of the remaining 15 abhuman races is quite varied, and there is permanent disagreement about their specific classification among the adepts of the overseeing subdivision of the Adeptus Administratum. Perhaps not totally surprising of these classifications, it is the Beastmen who are subject to the most severe persecution and have been placed on the register of prescribed citizens by the Adeptus Arbites. This means that Beastmen cannot travel nor live upon more than 300,000 worlds of the Imperium. The Tithe Administratum also forbids their conscription so as to fulfil Imperial Tithe obligations. It is likely that beastmen are close to being declared full mutants, meaning they can then be exterminated at will by Imperial forces. A large part of their slipping into this class is that they're just seemingly less useful than, say, Ogryn. And some of this is due to their just so-called, quote, coarse nature, as one rogue trader would describe them, and also the fact that they seem more comfortable aligning themselves with heretical cults and followers of chaos than they do humanity. I mean, that'll do it. 
although perhaps it's because they are so shunned by humanity itself that that's where they look to. Despite their seemingly rough nature and behaviour though, beastmen have been described as devious, even having been known to wish to atone for their mutations, which is tragic given they seemingly have no control over such things. In others, there appears also a pride to their physical aberrations, some even seeing themselves superior to ordinary humans. And some Imperials who have attempted to investigate the subculture of Beastmen find it difficult work, but are often surprised to find that they may well have a culture and faith that is entirely hidden from the Imperium. Many seem to have this intense arrogance, and this could signal as to why they so often fall in with the worshippers of the gods who promised them all. Anyway, Beastmen return, now let's talk about Tenth the Game. So in this section I want to discuss around what we actually know about 10th edition, the game of 40k itself. Now the short version of this is streamlined game, data sheets more accessible and the rules focused onto them, unit rules on a single data card, army rules on a single page. At launch all unit data cards and army rules available online for free, day one. Reduced complexity including the bloat of strats. Simplified but not simple and we'll come to that in a minute. Broad improvements to core details like turn structure, army selection, morale, terrain, missions, the ways in which characters interact with units and more. The 40k experience should feel convenient, compact, efficient. Force planning and organisation simplified to make for a more fun, interesting army combination. And for beginners, a preset version of the game in Combat Patrol, specifically designed forces that give a framework for helping people learn the game while keeping the fundamental keynotes of the game simple enough to make it easily learnable and keep it enjoyable. Now that's the PR spiel bullet pointed for you, but there are a lot of questions and many of which cannot be answered until they themselves, GW, share more information. Overall, personally, I think it sounds pretty bold, it's dramatic, interesting, positive. Before anything else though, cards on the table for me, because I don't talk about the actual tabletop game of 40k with great regularity. So to state the obvious, this channel is not a tabletop focused one. I don't have battle reports, nor a real interest in participating in nor attending specifically competitive events for 40k. Now having friendly games, I'm all about that. But for myself, 40k has been primarily about the lore, painting, fun games whenever I can get that happening. I currently enjoy Titanicus actually the most of any GW product. Now 9th edition was when I had really wanted to get back in strong for 40k on the tabletop. I remember it was going to be the summer of 2020 was my plan for when I was going to have a ton of games and know the rules inside out, start playing properly. I'd been trying to learn the rules at home and so forth. And then guess what happened? IRL, anything got cancelled. That honestly was the nail in my 9th edition coffin because by the time it all came around and people could go out to play the game again, it was just not feasible. This past year has been a busy one for me in terms of checking off big life goals and I really had little time for much else. Suffice to say, I had neither the drive nor time to get back on with playing 9th when people were very capably able to do so, especially knowing that 10th was right on the horizon. So instead, I have just been painting and I can probably field about three decent armies right now, I've got some other stuff on the go and with 10th on the cusp of arrival, I'm interested to see what it offers and if it's something someone with a busy life can fit in, which seems to be where they're aiming it at. 9th edition just suffered from its own complexity. I liken it to someone walking across a very muddy field. It seemed that as 9th continued, it just picked up more and more and more as it went along until you just can't move forward anymore. And that really is sort of how 9th appeared to feel and what I heard from many people. What seemed as initially standard community gripes, disagreements about one rule and another, it just steadily turned into people abandoning the game. And this apparently has been pronounced and vocal enough and likely, I guess, backed up with data enough that it's a situation Games Workshop seemed to really have taken on board. But there was another angle to it as well. I've seen and heard suggestions that the competitive side of the hobby was a driving force toward that overcomplication through continual requests, adjustments, tweaks that subsequently made the entire concept of codex books a farce because of the constant changing things. I think there's likely a bit of truth to that, only in as much as any competitive community always wants to refine their gameplay down and make it as tight and well 
competitive as possible. But I also think it's not really fair to suggest that that is the root cause. Because, for example, look at what happened with the Votan Codex. The book was basically void on day one after it was clear the Votan were just ridiculously powerful and they had to be rebalanced immediately. That was just a bizarre shambles, to be honest. And I think that's one reason why they've gone for this dramatic change in the 10th edition to sort of find a way around bizarre things like that happening. And perhaps we're going to learn more about how people that are just looking to play some 40k and not have the intensity and the focus and the strictness of the competitive game, but also how it can be catered for to the people who want that as well. Now, people are always going to debate the whys and the wheres, but I think the fundamental thing to bear in mind is that people can enjoy the tabletop game of 40k in a variety of ways. That should always be true. There's no fundamentally right or wrong way to approach it. People will disagree with that, but it's true. If I have some friends around and we decide we're going to drop a ton of the rules, you can do that. If you go to a club or a venue for an event, you need to be adhering to their designated rule sets and how they want to do it. And hopefully a sportsman-like spirit between the players. And especially, of course, if you're at a proper competitive event. But this broad inclusivity of playstyle has in fact been the bedrock of the game since its inception. Ultimately, whatever was the driving force behind it, the overcomplication of 40k during 9th, it just led to many people deciding to take a break from the game. I heard this more often in the past 6 to 9 months than I had done in the past 6 years from people I know personally who obviously play 40k. And we all know the meme about how many books you needed just to get your army up to speed and functioning. Not an issue if you are playing ninth from day one and you're the kind of person who just gets every single book. Plus keeping up with the updates, the changes, played it week in week out. But far less if you only just started playing or only had a game as and when you could fit it in. The impracticality and the confusion and the bloat just made that really not practical at all and unpleasant. Now all of that aside, what do I, me, personally feel about the sound of this new 10th edition. I'm actually excited for it. It sounds like everything I was hoping for, but that could of course be a premature statement, so feet on the ground for now. So what is changing in 10th? Well, from the live stream that they did, the core marks were that, as seems to have been anticipated, that simplified but not simple description really speaks to them wanting to try and find a way to make things, again, streamlined and efficient. To try and bring you the data, the rules you need in a way that makes sense, isn't fragmented across tons of books and random downloads. This in itself is something that would be quite an achievement if they can do it. And I think this is why they've taken the very drastic action of really retiring codex books essentially. Still, as I said right at the start, I do still think that faction codex books can return just perhaps in a different format. Maybe they'll have more lore, maybe they'll have mission campaigns for your faction, or fun custom games that require just one person to have the book to basically go by. Maybe, as I said, similar to the supplementary books you see for the Heresy and Titanicus. Maybe something in between, like the Necromunda supplements, offering lore, a smattering of small rules for specific units that are not essential to the core game, just little things to spice it up if you wanted to, but absolutely not essential for the standard gameplay. Those, those would be codex books I would still buy. Now, although they did cover very roughly, and of course they have to do things roughly on a live stream, how the data sheets and additional information like war gear, relics, psychic powers, strats, and things like this have been condensed, it wasn't really 100% clear on just what's going to be available or applied. Still, they were clear that the whole emphasis is on maintaining depth while simultaneously ensuring your rules are right and focused so you're not wading through books fragmented information again. If they can make that work, it sounds great. If it doesn't work, it could end up making the game feel too bland, not enough movement for individual embellishment. Again, we'll have to really wait and see. The condensing of things to make the game feel more tight continues into the game phases. For example, no more psychic phase, which personally I'm glad to hear. I never really understood why psychic powers really necessitated their own special phase. It can easily be dealt with alongside other things. I know, of course, that some psychic powers are kind of buffs and so forth, but again, they did say that they're going to kind of include those within the card rules and the data so that they can, I guess, happen more passively. But I think having psychic powers sort of within shooting or whatever, it makes sense in the flow of the game if you're thinking about it from an in fiction perspective, which is how I tend to approach these things. Very interesting also was the fact that they noted units no longer being lost to failed morale tests. They just interact differently and obviously less effective on the battlefield. 
This, again, makes a lot of in-fiction sense, and I think could make the game interesting. Imagine you've got broken units staggering around the battlefield, getting in the way, trying to take some kind of final action. Imagine a lone guardsman, mentally broken, his units being destroyed, but he still gets a shot off against all odds to take down one enemy. That sounds pretty amazing to me. Or they just go hide in a corner, which is <laughs> equally amusing. When it comes to the stratagems, I think this is something that many people curious about, many people complained about. They noted that the common stratagems that everybody can take will be a little bit bigger, but then the faction specific ones significantly smaller, which I think makes sense because this way you can easily learn the common strats. And if factions have only a few specific ones to choose from, then you actually have half a chance of being aware of what potentially your enemy's strats are going to be in terms of understanding like actually how they're going to play on the battlefield, not just have a quick look before you start. Their reasoning also seems to have been to take away situations where people could lay down these card combinations early in the game to ensure that maybe the games are feeling like they're actually being played between two armies, not just some kind of meta combination that really sort of, you know, you table your opponent or whatever. Again, I don't know really how much that happened. It's something I'll probably ask others about. But um, again, nonetheless, that seemed to be their rationale with that. But again, the biggest, most amazing thing still, the rules, data, points, free, digitally available day one, which is ridiculous. I never would have imagined that you could see that happen, but it really does open up things so much to new players now. Also, you'll be able to even test out forces that you've not invested in to see if you like them. It's a really bold move. I personally feel it's absolutely the right one for them to make at this point. It does show that they are thinking carefully about sort of how to make this stuff work. And I, I do think it is probably the right move at this time. They did also note that you will be able to purchase the physical data cards for your faction. And I will say, I'm sure many people, including me, will feel a great nostalgia for the Codex books, a sadness. But I think when you look at how long it took those books to be produced, it creates an extreme delay for some factions to get their new books, which creates balancing problems, frustration with players where their faction is just not really practical or becomes overpowered and there's difficulty in fixing that. It just, the way that works, it just doesn't really make sense in the modern digital age. It's simply just not practical. I love supporting books, don't get me wrong. I think just at this point, through 8th and 9th editions, it's clear that a different way just had to be tried. And I do applaud them for being brave enough to try something as dramatic as what is revealed for 10th edition, because I'm absolutely sure not everybody will be happy about it. There's obviously a lot of focus on making things more straightforward, but they also seem to want to focus on people having more combined arms forces in the game, creating an interesting force, not just a bulk of single unit types or you know primarily one thing going forward there's obviously going to be a litany of other questions people for example still going to want to hear about stuff like relic vehicles lords of war i've got many of these myself but undoubtedly they'll still be present interesting to see though again if there's gonna be rules for those on day one maybe we'll find out about that prior to release I think also this shift towards all your information being on the unit card instead of scattered around books and so on is designed to make rules to be more friendly digitally, which makes a lot of sense. You can imagine having an iPad or such where you can just swipe between those units that you've got to play the game in a much more straightforward way than before. And that actually those unit data cards on there on your tablet or whatever will actually have the information they need so you don't end up sort of having some of that there and the book and blah 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 so while physical cards could still be a thing and presumably the way it's going to work is you download and print off those rules i'm assuming that's the way it works on day one i think ultimately there is a shift toward making the rules more digitally practical i'm a little bit surprised actually they didn't really speak about that it seems very obvious that that must be the way that they're going and it makes sense when you consider how if something is going to need a tweak or a hotfix if you're going to do that in a video game if you need to update your game you obviously just update it and then people you know update their game you can't really do that with this kind of tabletop version unless of course all your rules are digital so they tried to do that before and it didn't really work. It didn't work because 9th edition and 8th edition were not practical for it. But with the way that they've designed things here, it actually could be practical to do that. So I think that's both a good reason and likely a core reason why they also chose this direction. The previous format of books, digital, uploading tweaks and updates to downloadable PDFs and so on and so on, it was just very clunky, fragmented. It was a pain in the ass, frankly. But even if you don't want to use digital rules or buy the cards, at least this way, presumably, you can just re-download any unit changes or faction changes and print them out again. That's my guess anyway, but we'll see soon enough. So a final word about all of this stuff. Ultimately, the long and short of it is the law stuff that's coming in is pretty cool, very interesting. We'll find out more about that as we go along. In terms of the 10th edition game, we really need to see how that game plays. Nothing else will suffice. 
still, in the interim, I may consider to, for example, we could get together a roundtable of people from the tabletop side of things, including some from the more just kind of having a friendly game point of view and some from the more competitive side. Let everybody give their thoughts there. I think that'd be interesting, interesting for me as well. As usual, my default, though, is not looking around at the opinion of others because I always think it's best to just give my thoughts before I start hearing the opinion and input of others, and that's what I did here today. But I will, of course, later check out thoughts from people like Winters, Liam, Van Vanguard Tactics, Tabletop Tactics, maybe Bricky, and Roof Slipping Meme Lord Valrock. My general overall feeling is this though, I've always thought that the base game for 40k should be easily comprehensible, enjoyable for anybody, be that highly engaged hobbyists or for people with busy lives, hectic family life and so on. And when I say the base game, I don't mean when you go into a games workshop and they roll a couple of dice and go, they are, you've played your first game. No, you haven't played your first game, you've just learned a couple of small things. The base game should be the game that most people are playing. If you're going to an event, then you can take it a level higher. But the base game should be straightforward enough that people can comprehensively easily get into it, but that doesn't become an exhausting quagmire of complicated rules. Rulebook, yes. Faction rules, yes. Strats, but not so many you're drowning, yes. Mission packs, things like that, yeah, sure. My view is, if Games Workshop on the tabletop to survive, it's got to be something you can help somebody learn over a weekend, just as I did with Titanicus and a friend of mine who was barely into the tabletop games at all. It has to be something that somebody like that will have the patience to be able to learn and play if you really want to get people more into things. Ninth, on the other hand, got so complex it became overwhelming, not just for new people, but for people who have played Warhammer for a long time. And when something you invest your time in is fundamentally for the enjoyment overwhelming is not the first word you really want to associate with it. With that said, for those who again want to play competitively, host tournaments and so on, they also should be able to get what they need from the game. And if that means that they have to have an advanced rule set to lay on top of the base game, then do that. I imagine this not dissimilarly to how, for example, a short while ago, Titanicus released a matched playbook. It was a very thin, inexpensive supplement that gave just clarification, guidance on how to approach things in a more strict competitive environment. And given the way they seem to be shifting with 10th, it surely seems reasonable that the same could apply to 40k, and that this could also be available as a downloadable PDF so that it could be updated easily. And again, you know, I'm not a competitive player, but I do know people who are. When that side of things have questions or they need something updated, that needs to happen quickly. So again, if you, are, if you have it separated to a degree from the kind of more base game, those updates could be happening more quickly for those guys so that they can get those fixes as they need. And it's not quite so critical for everybody else. At the same time, you still want to make sure that all your stats and unit data and all that kind of thing stays the same across the board. There's a lot of balls to juggle here to get it right. It's going to be very difficult. I'm looking forward to trying out 10th whenever that comes. If I were to be graced with an opportunity for some kind of preview, I'd probably get on it. But if it's just a case of waiting for it to release, I'll take a look at it as and when it comes. But I'll just finish by saying I started playing 40k when I was about 10 years old. I had so much fun with it in the second and third editions. I remember my first table mat was my parents' big green wool blanket we used for days out. And its heavy woolen nature did not make for stable gameplay at all. Now we're at 10th. And myself, after having been starved of the game for some years, I really look forward to playing again. Hopefully this edition will be something that really works for everybody. And I know that's pretty optimistic, but I think it's also achievable. 10th seems like a very big change and people always hate change. But in this case, could it be one where people really do welcome it, given how much complaints have been made in the past year about 9th? And arguably, what else really did people expect that they were going to do? It was pretty clear a lot of the big issues people had with the game. And if they weren't going to do something this dramatic, then what else did people really want them to do? I'm curious to see, I'm curious to see whether the reaction to this is going to be people very outraged and unhappy, or whether people are going to be very positive and inspired by, you know, taking this big change and going forward. So maybe I'll come back in a little bit of time with an update about that and we'll just sort of see where things lie, see where the dust has settled. Anyway, that's my thoughts about this announcement. Obviously, there'll be more to come down the road. If there's anything significant, I'll find a way to make that work. I hope you enjoyed this. If you did, of course, please remember to hit the like, share your thoughts about the 10th edition in the comments. Genuinely intrigued to see people's opinions. And as always, I will see you in the next one.